members and Mr. Gonzalez and district staff. The time is 6 p.m. on this day, the 13th day of September 2022. I call this business committee meeting of the United Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. The following board members are present. Ricardo Rodriguez. Ricardo Molina. Let the record show that this meeting has duly been called. That notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Action. Uh, agenda number one, to go please rise to the pledge of allegiance. Mr. Molina, the, the um, Texas legislator requires us to acknowledge that the school district in accordance with House Bill 5 has adopted a 22-23 budget that includes $358,310 for a, um, additional accelerated instruction to assist those kids that struggle with the end of year course exams. We also have to acknowledge that with House Bill 1495 that um, we're um, it's kind of hard to say because we don't lobby, but we become members of organizations that lobby on behalf of school districts like TASB, TASBO, and so we need to identify that portion of the dues that we pay as um, um, not lobbying per se, but the assistance at the state level when the state is considering maybe changing the funding formula or some education requirements. They will go on our behalf and gather the information and then they will see how advantageous it is for the school districts in the state of Texas. So for 22-23 budget, we budgeted $5,531.75, and last year we spent $8,295.47. Thank you. And B, the after school programs are based after school adventures and 21st century fit for the for the Good evening, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Molina, uh, members of the, of the audience. Uh, what I have for you is a quick presentation on our after-school program. We have two programs. One is uh, tuition-based, and we have it at 21 uh, campuses. Uh, and then we have this, this other uh, after-school program. It's called Fit for the Future. And it, we actually get a grant from TEA, and it's for eight campuses in the LBJ Theater uh, pattern, and that one is tuition free because we have a grant. But because you have a grant, you have to comply with certain things. So, especially in this particular grant, it, it requires us to have a caregiver for every 15 students in the program. So, uh, that is something we always have to consider when we're, uh, when we're letting children into the program. Do we have enough caregivers, et cetera, right? And so, this has been an issue because uh, let me just uh, put this right here. This is where you'll see that we kind of are short on caregivers. So we actually have students on a waiting list. So you'll see the names of the, of the campuses there, and you'll see the number of students on a waiting list, and this was as of the end of August. It's improved a little bit, but we still have quite a bit of children on this waiting list. And so, uh, again, the ones that have a grant that, that right behind the name is FFTF, we have to have a caregiver for 15 students. That's what the grant requires. The tuition base, we like the 15 to one, like sometimes we go 16, 17, but then sometimes we have children with special needs that sometimes we, step, we might have just five kids with that caregiver because there's a special needs student. So what we're seeing is that we are short of staff, and right now, as of August 31st, we had 660 kids on a waiting list. 
I know Mr. Gonzalez has got calls from parents wanting to know when are we going to get more caregivers. I know Ms. Lindon has the, the campus principals, and Ms. Morales has also gotten calls about concerned parents, right? So what we want to propose tonight, maybe it'll help us recruit more staff, right? Uh, just to let you know the recruitment efforts that the after school program has done for both programs. Uh, they've gone to, to job fairs, they've gotten with Laredo College, maybe some kids going into education if they want to come and work in our after school programs. We've posted on social media, uh, just work with the principals, et cetera, right? We've worked with HR to try to see if we can hire more people to help with the daycares. So what we want to propose tonight uh, and recommend, right now the pay is $9, and I know y'all are hearing throughout, you know, the, those teenage jobs that are out there that are now at $12.50, $13 an hour, and we've done our study of other school district daycares, and they're, on average, they're paying like $12 to $15 an hour. And so for right now, we'd like to, uh, we'd like the board to consider, it, it's not an action item. Yeah. If I may, Ms. Benavides, uh, Ms. Molina, Ms. Rodriguez, and uh, I know we have some uh, board members that are in the audience at this time. As superintendent of school, I do have the discretion to take action on this. It does not need uh, board approval, but I need to inform you. So because these are part-time employees, caregivers, I mean, they might have a full-time job during, during the regular time, but it's after school, it's part-time. I actually have the authority to do that. That is correct. So uh, something I wanna go into effect, effective October the 1st. But this time we're, we're informing you there's a proposal but um, we wanted to let you all know the reason behind it uh if going back to history i cannot remember the last time the district did any kind of an increase for after school day i mean we that it needs to be we need to make that change and uh, for good reason and for the record this is not a uisd issue per se there's a statewide issue there are districts across the state northeast right now last time i read it would have over 800 students on the waiting list they just can't hire anybody but we feel that this little increase will entice them and hopefully we'll be in a better place uh, pretty soon, real soon, okay? How many caregivers are we doing? Well, I think if, if, we go, if we go... Is she cover all of her school? With tuition and the uh, free tuition. Yeah, we want to go back and just kind of... Uh, it's not there. I think if you in the in the earlier slide, uh, you could see that there were 660 students, right? If you just kind of do a real quick calculation, at 15 to one, that's 44 daycare givers that we need. Uh, again, with the ones that are FFTF, that's a grant, so for sure we need you know one for the 15 students. We can kind of work with the other ones that aren't a grant uh, after school. But if you get that 660 and divide it by 15, it's about 44 caregivers that we need. So you can safely say that it doesn't, doesn't need voter uh, approval. Yeah. It just needs a superintendent to approve it. And then it can start. So you can say as of tomorrow, you can start reposting so people can come and hire. I mean, apply so they can get hired. Yeah, we can so start we can posting the and, and all that saying goes. that the so we can expedite it, yeah. I guess, cover for all those people that are in the waiting list. Right. Uh, we can work with Sam's staff on, on uh, we'd like it October 1st because it's kind of clean because September 30th is a Friday, but we can work with Sam's staff to see if, if we could bring up the effective date. I just don't want to mess with payroll right now, but uh, this would help us recruit. You're right. Well, at least to recruit and then right. start some of the background. Right. By the time we start on October 1st and they can start. Exactly. It'll be great. Yeah, knowing that they'll get, get paid the $12 an hour. And once again, Mr. is yes, it does not need board approval, but the superintendent is required by policy to inform you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see discussion of the presentation for UISD administration regarding the state mandated school safety action steps and matters in Senate Good evening, Mr. Molina, Mr. Rodriguez, members of the audience, board members in the audience as well. It's been a really busy summer and a busy first six weeks of this school year uh, with regards to the requirements um, from the state that resulted um, because of the Uvalde situation, right? 
UIZ has complied uh, with all of the actions of the state uh, that are re being required. We have modified our procedures. We have modified our workflows for um, orders with regards to exterior doors. And so uh, I want to kind of uh, give you a, a little glimpse as to what has been, uh, what already happened and what we are continuing to work on in the future. At this time, I would like to introduce to you all our new safety and crisis response manager. And this is Mr. Ruben Ayala, who would be giving you a little overview of the uh, state mandated actions uh, with regards to campus safety. Good evening, board members, superintendent, audience. Um, so briefly, what I'll be doing is giving you a description of what has been um, what we've been doing and what has been mandated by the state. So we have conducted a summer targeted partial safety audit, um, provided training, and we've already reported this to the state as well as to our safety committee. We've also conducted exterior door safety audits, also reported to our committee as well as to the state. Uh, we have convened the district safety and security committee. Uh, we met with them and we reviewed the multi-hazard or EOP, emerging operating plan, as well as um, the components of the EOP, which are several <coughs> annexes and dependencies that are required by the state now. We ensure that all campus staff, including substitutes, are trained, which is also one of the state mandates. Um, and in this, what we've done is they've been scheduled and we have um, a, a, uh, a video that they, every person getting hired will be, uh, will be able to see and have that training. So everybody's receiving the exact same training. There's no differentiating by a different administrator presenting something different. Everybody is seeing the same exact training. Uh, we've scheduled all mandatory drills for the school year. That's already been done. Ensured all threat assessment team members are trained. The campuses have uh, trained, and this is the video that was created. Also included the behavior threat assessment uh, component. Reviewed and updated access control procedures. So for all use, uh, for the use of your access control procedures must include exterior door sweeps. Um, we have our police department helping us with that, and they're doing exterior door checks every week, um, reporting those. Um, and that is part of our workflow as well. Uh, if there is any exterior door issue coming up, we have an expedited workflow that targets that as a safety issue and it's handled first, keeping priority. Um, we're ensuring doors are closed and locked uh, in every instructional facility at least once per week. Um, this is the letter that was sent from uh, Governor Abbott to the uh, Texas School Safety Center. Uh, indicating what he was wanted and what was, he was going to be requiring uh, as mandated uh, through their office. Uh, this is the letter from Abbott, Mr. Uh, Governor Abbott uh, to the Commissioner, uh, Mr. Moran, uh, in what he wanted TEA to do uh, and also state his mandate for us. Uh, and this is the actual letter from uh, Commissioner Moran indicating exactly what the state mandate, which we have explained uh, before. This is the certification that was sent on our uh, summer school safety audit, as well as our door audit. It's already been submitted to the state. This is the summer targeted partial safety audit. So this is a sample of questions as a total. Uh, when you take all the pieces and parts of 243 questions, we did option B, um, which was to have our SSEO uh, at every campus conduct these audits and submit these questions to our department. Um, these were the questions that were asked. If you notice, there's uh, in some of these, there's four parts additional to the question, and they also were required to answer those questions. This has already been presented as well, as I said before, to the summer to the uh, safety committee, um, as well as been submitted to the state. This is the exterior 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 door component uh, that were checked in part of the audits, and this is the uh, tracker that is being used. Uh, was recommended by the Texas School Safety Center, and we decided to go ahead and use uh, their tool. So this is further information. Um, we're looking. Okay. Uh, we're looking at grants to fund additional safety components. Uh, we're exploring the panic buttons, which is also part of what TA is uh, asking us to do, and further, they'll give us further guidance guidance on that as it comes. Uh, training of campus and district administrators. Um, we already conducted that on July 26th. Uh, provided uh, turnkey training models uh, to our administrators and teachers and staff. So that is the video that was created so that it could be turnkey and everybody could receive the exact same training. No differentiating, nothing left out. Everybody hears the same thing. Um, 
train all campus substitutes as well as they, they, anybody that gets hired will still continue to receive that training so that everybody knows our safety procedures and protocols. Uh, met with School Safety Committee on September 7th at SAC. Uh, we met with them and the agenda there was uh, the results of the door audit. Uh, reviewed that. We reviewed also the uh, summer safety audits, uh, district, emerging operation, dist district emergency operation plan, as well as the appendices, uh, including the active threat, uh, which had an uh, appendix uh, for the active shooter as well, uh, bad weather and biohazards. Uh, for September uh, regular board meeting, we will be presenting the emergency operation plan in its final phase, uh, with all of the additions that the state has required us to add into there, and uh, we'll be waiting for your approval on that. As well as metal detectors have been delivered and set up in every elementary school, including uh, Molina Middle School. Uh, IDs for high school students are being uh, are will be begin by the uh, second six weeks in October. Uh, labeling of all classroom windows through the exterior. Uh, we have the exterior doors labeled. Uh, we will be labeling exterior windows as well. Uh, labeling of all outdoor facilities. Uh, we did have a site visit from the Texas School Safety Center. Um, my fourth day on the position. Uh, that was on October, August 25th, on behavior threat assessment specifically. Uh, and then we, uh, we're gonna continue to keep researching any grant opportunities for safety so that we can fund it, uh, any other projects that we can find that will help with our safety of our schools. Uh, intruder audits by state are uh, starting, so they started this week. Uh, there's intruder audits, we're actually having an update training tomorrow, um, so we'll be doing that virtually with them uh, as well. And uh, we, and submit the EOP to the state by October 12th, hopefully before then. Thank you. So I just wanted to share with you all that the EOP, which is the Emergency Operations Plan, we are at about 800 pages, all right? And so it details what to do before, what to do during, and what to do after the uh, steps of a major situation or a major crisis. And so it has been, you're gonna see a lot of repetition. I will bring that to you all next month um, with regards to what um, we have to comply. This is going to be reviewed by the state. Uh, and then of course we'll, we'll get the approval or what we have to remedy in that case. And this is everybody across the state of Texas submitting the emergency operations plan. So just when we think we're finished with the plan, we get another annex, and that was what, Tuesday of, no, Thursday of last week, we get another addition. And in some cases, there's some things that, you know, you, you probably don't think would ever happen here. Like for example, um, they'll, they'll bring in a, a pipeline um, issue that, you know, there was a, it's by our campus, we're going to have to shut down because there's a gas leak or a chemical leak through a pipeline or a gas line. And so it may impact campus A, B, C, or D. And so you have to have your before, your during, and your after steps. So some of the things are things that we have never experienced, never probably have ever uh, looked at uh, in that sense, but those are the items that are now required um, at the state level uh, to address in our emergency operations plan. We've always had a plan, um, but not the specific details that they are asking for us. Uh, with regards to active shooter, active threat, um, and the biohazards now that are being considered. So I, we met with uh, UIAZ PD. They reviewed the active threat, active shooter, because they're the ones who have more experience. When we met with our safety committee, Mr. Rodriguez, you were here, we broke up each annex and we handed a section to each group. So the law enforcement uh, people reviewed the active threat. And so they made suggestions. So we went back and reviewed and tweaked those suggestions. The, uh, the county reviewed some of the biohazards. And so we went back, they tweaked, we, we uh, revised a few items with regards to that. And then the, the last one that was on there, the big one, is the bad weather. Uh, because bad weather could include hurricane, tornado, flood, um, uh, uh, ice, um, freezing temperatures, and even heat. So there's so many um, different components to that. So we continue to work on those particular items. Um, we will bring that plan to you. Uh, we'll bring you that, that uh, draft plan so that you can review at next week's board meeting. And then uh, we'll go back, revise as needed, and then hopefully submit to the state prior to October 12th deadline 
that has been given to us. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, no. So we do have, um, with regards to, we've had issues with students bringing uh, weapons. Um, for the record, uh, we've had numerous individuals. So we look at the criminal component, and that's when we always involve our police department, our law enforcement, all right? So they determine, that'll be what, six inches? Five and a half inches or more. That's when you can place a student. The size of the knife, the size of the weapon, of course, is the triggering mechanism for that, all right? So then we also look at the age of the student, right? Um, and so when there's different uh, infractions with regards to a weapon being on campus, um, we our practice has always been to send a notice to the campus, to the parents of the individuals or the campus that was impacted or affected somehow. So we've had three letters at one campus that we've already sent out. Um, on Friday's incident, we send out, and I'm just going through the procedures that we, we follow. Um, in reference to it being a BB gun, there were disciplinary consequences that were administered, but not necessarily disclosed because of FERPA issues with regards to what actions were taken with the student. But we look at, number one, the age of the child. If the child is less, younger than 10 years of age, we cannot detain or arrest the student, all right? So we take other measures other um, approaches to disciplinary consequences. It could be in school suspension. It could be out of school suspension. It could be uh, bus privileges removed and they ride the bus. It could be uh, refraining from interacting with other individual students. So there's other actions that are taken. Normally when the law determines that there is an infraction that, that because of their age, they could not be arrested, but it merits, if they would have been that 10 years or older, then we take action and we go with ISS. At the elementary level, we do not have an ISS placement. We do not have an alternative campus. So what we have done in the past is we take the child that has committed the infraction and we assign them to the ISS in school for the number of days that any other student would have gotten, all right? Um, so we look at those particular issues. When it merits, if it would have been a gun, if it would have been a knife larger than five and a half inches, then of course we take immediate action, we have disciplinary hearings, and there's a um, scale that we utilize for placement to remove a child or student from the um, general setting. What we have done in the past, like I mentioned, going back to the procedures, we advise, send notices out to the parents, because we do want to be transparent. In this case, in hindsight, we only send it to these parents who were impacted because the situation happened on the bus. It did not happen inside the school setting. So campus administration we were dealing with on Friday, we sent the letters to the individuals who were on the bus. Are there both districts or one district? Both. They were outside the campus, or inside the campus? They were already on the bus. But did they enter the campus? Yes, sir, but it was never notified that My anybody. Question, okay. So where's the security? Where's the safety? Sir, there's one security guard, one police officer on the campus. And I'm not making excuses, yeah, yeah. but that's, we're, that's, we're looking at that. Now, the only thing I understand, and I do agree with you, but for me so much, I understand is the safety. Yes, sir. I mean, if this, and it's going to come out to the public, and I think the public already gets called all the board members. Uh, how can we explain that to the parents if it went inside of the school? 
how can we reply to the parents? How can this happen in our schools? So that means it's not safe here. You know, the student can bring something in there. It's scary. Put it public. Absolutely, sir. So, um, and, and just with any situation that comes up, so part of the procedures is to have an action item after action review. Mm -hmm. And so that is exactly how the LCD school administrator who will speak with law enforcement. And so that because of things that happen like this, is where we find out where our weaknesses are, where our strengths are, and then develop a plan. Uh, and, and, and I agree, sir. And I think I've attended the safety committee meetings, and I think the safety committee meetings should be brought once while it's been to the past. This should have already been in place. I know that there's still tweets in there that the that they could always be brought up to the board and we could have thrown off the park and it should have been already in place more than what we are right now. This here it still hasn't even gone to the board. This should have been in place prior to even school start. You know, not right now, because it's we're already how many months in school it's going for two months already and there's still nothing in place. It's still going before the board, so we can still approve something that should have been in place prior to the school start. But if an incident, God willing, incident happened, there's nothing in place yet. It hasn't come to the board. Actually, it hasn't. You, you've you approved it two years ago. So every year- But not every uh, The active shooter, active threat, it, it, it has a, sem a, a semblance of, of something. So it's modified with more requirements. Which uh, is that? Correct. Okay, so we've always had, we've always had. So it's, it's a working document, is what it is, and when we got the letter from TA, it was June the 30th. So although, uh, as a district, we're making modifications. Now TA sends the letter says these are required that we have to. So we're now we're complying with them. So we are working. Rodriguez, members of the board, Mr. Molina, I will tell you that is it a perfect working document? No, it isn't. So we learned by trial and error, but we can't afford to learn like that. So we got to do a better job, and I think for responsibility. And I'll leave it at that. I mean, I will tell you that we're going to continue as a dish and move forward. We've got to do a better job. We normally do not use the metal detector at elementary. There really has never been a need. Now, we have the metal detector at students. the camp, not for students. Okay? In this case, now we've got, we've got to revisit it. On a past positive note, for, for everything or something, Paul, that I will tell you, specifically at the middle school, what happened today, the message, and I know we've seen our board members with my own in particular, when he comes out in our message, if you see something, report it. That's exactly what's been happening. That's what happened at the middle school today. So if anything pause, that's coming out. But as far as our safety plan, it is a working document. We're going to continue to tweak it to make it safe for our students and our, and our, and our, and our employees. But as superintendent, I take responsibility. <clears throat> I do a better job, and, and I take it. Okay? I have a question. Um, I, I believe in the, in the punitive part, I, I get that. But what are, you know, it's a working document, so we need to be learning from this. Um, for one, I think board, I was not informed. <clears throat> I don't know if you were, Mr. Montemayor, but I got a call from a parent. That's how I got informed of the incident. Um, and secondly, I, I, I understand we have the metal detectors at elementaries and middle schools. We're not using them. I think the common theme I, I read throughout some of the messages that were sent to me were the backpacks. I don't know if that's something we can do away with, something we can modify. And then secondly, the going entering into a bus, is there some sort of security check prior to students going onto a bus? And then thirdly, yes, again, the punitive part I get, but we're talking about elementary and middle school, even high school students. There needs to be a lesson. There needs to be some sort of reform. I'm a mental health professional. I believe in looking at everything that led up to that event, what's going on at home, you know, maybe CPS needs to be involved. Maybe there's a bigger picture here that we're, we're missing and we just want to go to the punishment part that doesn't always, that <laughs> rarely takes care of the problem. The problem will persist. We, we need to take it holistically. We need to look uh, at, at the student and see how we can help the student. That so is a behavior we, threat component. Right. That is a, the behavior threat assessment that we have to apply <coughs> now that it is required. Uh, before it was probably not as extensive uh, and not as, um, I guess, <coughs> dropped down from the state level. Now there's not required. So okay. they'll be mod they even put a PIMS code for threat assessments uh, for our students. So we have to comply and we have to have counseling sessions. What reform right. methods are we going to yeah. utilize? Not just punitive, so, punitive, yes. punitive. But let me just clarify the metal detectors at the elementary level were, were installed. You don't even have 10 days with these metal detectors. So they just came in, okay. all right? 
And so we use them, but we don't run 700 students through a metal detector, all right? Because our students are coming in from the gym, from the cafeteria, from other entrances. So we don't have um, a, a system in place where we have metal detectors at every single door to monitor those particular students. We don't have hand ones that we review every single kit. We do random backpack, backpack checks, which is what the campus is going to be conducting now. And so they want to do that. We talked about clear backpacks or not allowing backpacks for the, for the future. But I could see the, the kindergartner dropping the Chromebook. Yeah. And they're, I, not, they're not going to be able to handle that. Yeah, yeah. And so there's, there's pros and cons to that. If you were to talk to any parent of, of the involved the parents that lost their child's life, they wouldn't care about a Chromebook. They're not going to care about anything other than exactly. their child's life. Oh, I, I understand. Yeah. I understand. So, that. so we, I think it, it, it's it's our responsibility to do everything we can, even if it's inconvenient for us. So what, what we talk to Ms. Caballero about, the campus level is okay. So every morning, you have all your students open up your backpacks. We put that on the parents as well, ma'am. The parents also have to look to see what is being brought to school. Correct. Right. I'm not, I'm so not judging they say it has way. to be that partnership right. established because if they have, if they know that that child had that BB gun or yes, a weapon, yes, yes. so why wasn't it secured? Those are so many other questions that we have, and so it has to be that partnership that we have to establish. We will continue to do our threat assessments. We will track that particular student uh, as well. But you are correct, we have to do uh, yeah. the reform components of the behavior. Right, right, and, and definitely parents, Ms. Vicks was saying parents need to be involved there. I totally agree. And I'm not in any way pointing a finger in any direction, right. um, because when you point a finger at someone, three fingers point right back at you. So I'm, that's not what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to save lives. It's not what can we do to protect our students? That's the number one issue right now. Um, my phone was blowing up today. Uh, everybody's scared, everybody's concerned, everybody's angry, and I think, um, as board members, we, we need to hear their calls. We need to hear their, their pleas for help. And, I, I, and I'm a parent too, you know. I, I, if my children were still in, in the public school system, which they're all grown, they're all out, outgrew the system, but um, I would be very scared to send my child to school. Uh, even sitting here, you know, I saw the security guard go out and check, or the police officer go out and check, and I thought, oh no, no, like, you know, myself included, like checking for security. Um, that shouldn't happen. We should make sure that every door is checked. Every, you know, um, we don't want another situation. We don't want anything to happen. Mm -hmm. Not even what happened with this BB gun. But when they go into the bus, are their backpacks checked? Is there any sort of security check on the bus? Well, they board the bus in the morning, then, so, so there's no check. There's nobody to check yeah. the bus. I have, the I have a question, and uh, one of the things that was uh, brought up to me is how long were the other children in the bus? Who helped the other children in the bus? What happened with the bus? And you were talking right now about the afterward, during, and the, and, and the before. And I have a lot of concerns as to how that was, how that happened when these other kids were in the bus too. And to me, what this tells me is that we need someone with experience because I don't want somebody practicing and gaining experience with my child's safety, especially like you said about the Uvalde thing. That, that's not going to happen with my kid. You're not going to be experiencing with my with my kid. So I want someone with experience and knowledge to be sure that our kids are safe in the school because this just demonstrated that you are not capable, you are is right now not capable of handling something like that and you just admitted it. So I'm asking to please look into the safety and bring in as many people as you can that can look into it, not like last time that you kicked me out of the room when I have a lot of safety experience and law enforcement experience. So I would like and I would appreciate it to do that. Thank you. Merendona, I think I remember when we took the, the locker down Yes, sir. I don't want to go. And just for the record, I would like to say the safety and security is a set committee. I did not kick Mr. Orlando out of any meeting. It is a set committee established by you all. We have uh, guidelines and issues that we have to follow by the state level. So I ask everybody who was not a standing member of that committee to please exit the room. And so it was not to target Mr. Orlando at all. And so I would like to just share that for the record that I did not kick anybody out. Okay, like I said, the, we took the lockers down and then we started using the dogs. Yes, sir. For, for we, and we, all that stuff. So, you know, I think we should get more dogs to, to, uh, to run for it. So that we can look into, yes. Rant, rant. Yeah. That, I think that'll help a lot. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Item A, approval of uh, monthly disbursement. 
Yes, Mr. Rodriguez, the Division of Finance uh, prepared the monthly disbursement book for you all to review. If you have any questions at this time, we can uh, put it through. Item B, approval of budget amendments. Yes, sir, this is the first budget amendment we're bringing for fiscal year uh, 2023. We had a, a, what I would call a behind the scenes upgrade in our finance system, where some mechanisms were being upgraded in our uh, budget prep file. And in that file, everybody's salary is correct, every raise is correct. However, sometimes the budget code didn't correspond with the person's position, so we have to correct these budget codes. There's no effect on fund balance, there's no effect on anybody's salary, there's no effect on anybody's raise or anything. It's just with this upgrade, so, uh, the budget code did not always follow that person's position when we dumped it into live. So this is just a, 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 a informal, formal request to change the budget to match everybody's um, salary expenditure. Pardon me? <laughs> Item D, approval of uh, 40 bids, proposals, and qualifications. Good evening, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Molina, and board members in the audience. For the record, my name is Karina Mendoza. I am the purchasing manager. And um, staff is coming to you to for the following approvals, so the following bids. RFP 2022-006, we have an updated tabulation for the Dyslexia Instruction Program only for the Special Education portion, Reading Horizons. RFP 2022-049, the SMOP and WebMOP services to Universe Corporation. RFQ 2022-003, District-Wide Environmental Asbestos Testing and Abatement Consultant, um, to the most qualified Terracon consultant and second most qualified Alpha Terra engineer. RFP 2022-042, consulting services for development of existing facilities needs assessment and master plan to ADM group to the um, estimated annual amount as noted. RFP 2022-044, district wide pest control services, recommended vendor ASESH Terman in pest control. CSP 2022-048, job order contracts for district-wide construction and general maintenance projects to Lion Durga Construction of Texas, Quantum Construction, American Contracting and Roofing, Summit Building and Design, Sercucha Construction, and Romo Construction. RFP 2022-035, welding equipment supplies and services to Tim, South Texas. RFP 2022-036, hardware supplies to the recommended vendors as noted. RFP 2022-037, part supplies and installation for security alarms, fire alarms, and public address system to Superior Alarms, Alan Yoder Enterprises. RFP 2022-043, paint and paint supplies to PPG Paints and Sherwin Willis. RFP 2022-046, electrical supplies to CED Laredo and 3G electrical supply. RFP 2022-038, bus vehicle repairs and services, AC services to the vendors noted, body repair and collision to the vendors noted, transmission repair to the vendors noted, gasoline, diesel, CNG, electrical services and manner to the vendors noted, Radiator repair to the vendors noted. Wheel alignment balancing to the vendors noted. Brakes suspension to the vendors noted. And we have three renewals for consideration. Do we have any questions? No, no, thank you. Thank you. Going to item C, to skip or resolution to approve uh, the 2022 appraisal role at the uh, Good evening, uh, Mr. Molina, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Gonzalez, members of the audience. I bring to you the resolution to approve the 2022 appraisal roll as the 22 United IAZ tax roll uh, with a levy of $245,091,857.01. Uh, Do you have any questions? Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we go back to item E. The goal of the revision of 2022-2023 calendar due to bad weather on August 15, 2022. 
I'm going to bring you this uh, item to you for your approval with regards to the August 15th date when we had um, the severe flood watch. So we have looked at our calendar with the curriculum and instruction, and we are removing the um, individual, the holiday that was set for President's Day on February 20th. We have removed that day, and that way uh, the August 15th day was noted as a holiday to TEA, and so we will still have 175 days of instruction, uh, and we are coming to school on February 20th. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, the rule of class size waivers for the fall of 2022. So I bring to you the uh, presentation with regards to class size waivers. These are the classrooms that are over the 22 to 1 ratio from pre kinder through fourth grade. Uh, we are looking at a total of 83 class size waivers. And I would like to share with you um, the historical is on the following page. Um, that's what is in pink. That means that 83 classrooms across uh, pre kinder through fourth grade are over the 22 to 22. Um, allotted teacher uh, student ratio. And so we do have to submit this information to the state. We do have to advise our parents that they are in a classroom that exceeds um, the, um, the 22 to one. And um, so we make those modifications. We also have to present um, this to DIC for approval, but we would like for you to uh, approve this class size. When you see the historical there, you see uh, the trend that we have had. This year was just a little different. We have grown tremendously, 1,800 students at the elementary level. And so uh, we had staffed um, accordingly, but the growth that we have had, when you see your enrollment sheets, we have 1,800 students. Uh, about 80% of the growth has been at the elementary level. So we are submitting our request for waivers. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, this one, one side, this one, how would you Never seen 88 waivers. So, I mean, I've been here seven years. How are we going to prevent this? Are we going to hire more teachers? Is there a plan in place? We're addressing as they come in. I know, for example, right now, Kay Zapata, today we approved another pre K teacher. We get that threshold, we're the class we're going to Can we get an update on this next month? Because I, I, I think Absolutely. Is, I, and I think our yes. teachers are, especially at elementary and perhaps middle school. We can update next month, absolutely. I, I would like to state that what we do, um, and we're looking at, at those, we do monitor Mr. Montemayor. So when we hit 24, say there are three teachers, um, and I'm, I'm looking at Reese that we're looking at, there are 24 in first grade, 24, 24, 23, 23. One more student is coming in, so they'll all be at 24 with the exception of one class. So we cap it at 24. And then we have to send those students to another campus. So that would entail bus, transportation, and so forth. Because we cannot keep adding 28, 29 students without necessarily adding another teacher. So we do look at that, but that grade level already is over seven students. And so uh, we look at those, we cap, we move on. But in this case, Reese is with Salinas, and Salinas is, is one more student, then they'll be asking for waivers as well. That's a lot, because it's just a lot of Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Rodriguez, Ms. Molina, Mr. Gonzalez, members of the audience. I'm here before you again to uh, request that we recommend uh, for our T test appraiser. We have one more uh, an addition at Washington Middle School, and so we're asking you to please approve uh, another appraiser for us this time. Uh, I'm a full of sales for this position of the South Furniture and Equipment. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Molina, Superintendent Gonzalez, and members of the audience. This time we bring before you the request for approval of the sale of the listed, uh, sale or disposition of the listed solid furniture and equipment uh, through a public auction at a future date. Do you all have the date, please? Uh, tentatively, with your approval next week, uh, we have reserved September 30 with our contracted auctioneer company. Thank you. Thank you. My approval of the internal audit plan for 2022-2023. Good evening, Mr. Molina, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Gonzalez, and members of the audience. I bring to you our plan, our 
internal audit plan for the 2022-2023 school year. Um, it's being presented for your approvals. The purpose of the plan is to provide guidance on the scheduled audit work for the year. The plan itself was prepared based on a risk-based analysis that includes risk, materiality, prior internal audits, changes in service or technology, or just the need for an audit presence. We also request input from administration and the board, and the plan is flexible, subject to change for any, uh, to allow for any uh, requests that come in during the year from the board and or the superintendent. Um, other things that I just want to mention, because we need to mention it annually as part of our internal uh, audit standards. In accordance with the internal audit standards, please note that the internal audit department's purpose, authority, and responsibility are found in the internal audit charter, in its code of ethics, and in board policy CFC local. These are all available on the UISD website. Also, in accordance with Texas Education Code 11.170 and the internal audit standards, the internal auditor reports administratively to the superintendent and functionally to the board of trustees to ensure its independence. Do you all have any questions or uh, comments on the plan? Thank you. I'm Jay, full of implementation of buyback program for the transportation and transportation 187-207 based hourly reports. Mr. Ramirez, I'm sorry, Mr. Rodriguez, mind so well, Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Molina, members of the audience. Uh, on, on this item, it's actually 186 days to 107 uh, days, excuse me. <laughs> so the, it's recommended board approval for an employee incentive to sell the up, to, up to three personal days to the district in order to assist with the days do not, they are not contracted to work. The administration has established criteria for buyback program. This is, I think, the second year in a row we're doing this for employees. And it's provided again, 186 uh, day employees, 207 at will, hourly employees, the opportunity to receive compensation for days leave occurred when they are not contracted to work. Now the criteria for this is simply, they must have three or more years with UISD. They must have a cured state local leave balance of at least 30 days or more as of June the 30th. And a written uh, declaration must be submitted by the employee requesting three paid leave days. So we're looking at a possible total of uh, 700, 759 employees. And again, these are bus drivers, bus monitors, food service cooks, uh, employees that we're just trying to help out. Okay, all of the questions for members, the use of uh, discretionary funds for various Again, it's recommended that the Board of Trustees approve uh, the request and the use of discretionary funds. Uh, I can go over them, sir. Uh, this is for Kennedy Zapata. First one, 2,999.39. Uh, for Ricardo Molina. And this is for programming radio frequency. Some more radios for the campus. These are not the radios that provided for security of police. This is for probably for the office clerks, office staff. A number of items there: uh, toner cartridges, uh, and images for the printers, and so forth. So this is for all the programs. Yes. Thank you. Item L, approval of memorandum of understanding between United ISD and the County Juvenile Department allowing its probation officers access to the UISD campus. Uh, yes, Mr. Rodriguez, we reviewed these MOUs with the counties. These come along on an annual basis and we are signed off on the changes. Like what, uh, MOU? Yes, sir. Ma'am, approval of a memorandum of understanding between the UISD and the Webb County Juvenile Department providing teachers to the Youth Village Detention Center. Yes, sir. Once again, our office reviewed this uh, document and we're uh, recommending that it's approval. Thank you. And discussion of possible action to approve memorandum of the understanding of the Radio Independent School District regarding administrative cost sharing for the Webb County Schools Plan. 
Yes, sir, this is a, a new MOU and it's uh, very beneficial for United. As you're aware, we have the Webb County school lands that we share and trust with both Webb Consolidated ISD and LISD. And LISD is gonna to propose to their board to share the administrative cost here with United where we've usually been on the hook for 100% of the cost. And it's gonna be broken down based off of a PEAM snapshot, which usually comes out to about 66% to 34%. So um, it is something that's beneficial for our district. So we would recommend approval. Yes, sir. Motion to adjourn.